the valet pushed the blind queen through the landscape. He did his best to avoid the cracks in the warped, shattered roads and provide his queen with a smooth journey. She must not be inconvenienced. The blind queen's wheeled throne was a shopping trolley, the front cut out. Her legs dangled from the front and her shoes occasionally scuffed the ground. The boy pushed. The throne and the queen were decorated with prizes born of a pair of lives survived. Trinkets and baubles scavenged from blown out houses and the fingers of desiccated corpses. The queen lived in splendour. The boy for his part was dressed modestly, torn brown scraps of cloth under a heavy damp overcoat. Boots held together with the last few pieces of duct tape left in the world. He was around 17 years old, give or take. Rat bones crunched under the small rubber wheels. What is that, boy? Pebbles, my queen, replied the boy, bending slightly to the queen's ear. The most beautiful pebbles. We are somewhat near a beach. Splendid, said the queen. I do not smell the brine. My queen, the wind does not favour it. The queen nodded and smiled. Her milky eyes blinked. The landscape swayed around them. It swirled and bit at them, but never changed. It was light brown and speckled with remnants of the queen's kingdom. How many more days, thought the boy. How many more? A life survived, not lived. A kind of peace, a kind of acceptance. Duty was all that was left. The valet pushed the blind queen. Night was falling. Up ahead, the mouth of a collapsed tunnel. Things circled in the air. Pushing the queen inside and kicking rubble to make space for a small fire, he sat on his haunches and struck at his flint. A hotel, said the queen. A hotel, my queen. Quite glorious. We have a veranda. A veranda, said the queen. Keep the windows open. I do love the breeze. I will, replied the boy before returning to his spark. The fire was enough to dry the front of the boy's clothes and the queen's legs. Her stockings, mouldy and gnawed, seemed animated by the movement of the modest flames. The boy was silent. Tell me, boy, said the queen loudly, do you miss your home? Your family? No, my queen, replied the boy. To serve you is the greatest honour. I scarcely remember my home. Very good, said the queen. Very good. Is our journey on track? It is, my queen. We should reach the citadel in but a few weeks. This was a lie, of course. The citadel did not exist, but he must serve his queen. She must travel to the citadel, and he must push the queen. The queen wasn't heavy. Her bones were like bird bones. The throne, covered though it was with decoration, tools and equipment to serve their journey, moved freely when the terrain allowed. The boy was strong, with thick arms and wide shoulders. That was, after all, why he was selected. It was an honour to push the queen. His father had pushed the queen's mother many years ago, and the queen was always blind. She had to be. They slept. dreams the boy was walking through a lush green forest. Birds sang high in the branches and the sunlight unlocked the green moisture from the leaves all around him. He breathed deeply. A rustle in the middle distance and low branches were flung aside. A growl, heavy feet. The bear was on him before he had time to react. He jerked awake. 
his back wet with sweat. In the morning the boy prepared breakfast for the queen, meat charred in last night's fire, a vegetable still warm in its mushy centre. Before we go, said the queen between dainty mouthfuls, you must give my regards to the chef. The boy didn't look up from his meat. I will, my queen. I expect your visit has been quite the highlight of his career. It most definitely has been, said the queen, dabbing the corners of her mouth with a rotten handkerchief. The valet pushed the blind queen through the landscape. The sun bore into his forehead. The queen did not perspire. Her class hadn't for generations. Unseemly. The half-stagnant water in the gallon jug sloshed against the sides of the throne. A reminder more would be needed soon. I wish to meet my subjects, announced the queen. The boy pushed the throne. I will seek a town and send word ahead of your arrival, my queen, he said his confidence and wavering. It was one of the first things he was taught. Your voice, they said, must always be definite. It must always carry the message clearly to your queen. You must never betray her trust by allowing doubt to enter you. A strong back, a clear voice. The boy scanned the shimmering horizon. It was around midday. The sun was heavy on his upper back and shoulders. It shone off the throne and pierced his skull. He raised his head, and on the dust-swept road ahead, humans. The boy's heart plummeted. He stopped pushing. What is it, boy? asked the queen. Why do you stop? Subjects, my queen, said the boy. His voice did not betray his shaking body. Your subjects approach. How wonderful, exclaimed the queen. Her brittle, snapped teeth crept from her mouth in a smile. The men were getting closer. They were armed, of course. Everyone except the boy was armed, it seemed. It would do the boy no good to carry a weapon. He was not trained to fight, just to push and to talk. Three of them. He could smell them already. Hot leather, cracked lips, dried blood on rusted machetes. He kept his eyes on the road. They stopped a few meters away from the throne. A long moment passed. He could hear them breathing. The Queen could hear them breathing. Good day, said the queen. Her subjects, of course, could not speak unless spoken to first. The men were silent, save their breath. The boy was paralyzed. He gripped the handle of the throne. His fingers grew numb. My queen, these subjects have come to pay their respects and welcome you to their town, he said. A little too quickly, a little too loudly. Remember your training, remember. The men looked at each other. They looked at the boy. The man in the centre was huge, thick-backed, barrel-chested with a full beard, heavy feet, tearing away branches. The boy swallowed hard. He sought and found the man's eyes. He held them. Gentlemen, my queen is passing through your town. We are grateful for your hospitality. The bearded man squinted at the boy. The other two men looked to their leader. Why do they not speak, boy? asked the queen her smile still present. I, they, I believe they are held speechless by your beauty, my queen, and the honour of your presence. 
The queen gurgled a modest laugh. Oh, but of course. She addressed the men directly. We are on our way to the citadel. Have you been? The men looked at each other. No, growled the bearded man. Above them, some kind of flying creature screeched. We must carry on with our journey, my queen, if we are not to be late, said the boy gently to the queen's ear. The queen, her smile fixed, seemed to consider this for a moment before responding. Oh yes, yes of course, boy, we mustn't be late. Well, dear subject, it has been a pleasure to meet you. Your town is enchanting. Good day. thin, weasel-faced man furrowed his brow. The man with the shotgun lifted his cap to scratch his patchy scalp. If you'll excuse us, please, said the boy, and planted his weight on his back foot, bracing his arms against the throne's handle. I must push the queen. He increased the pressure on the handle. The wheels of the throne spun slowly in their sockets, aligning themselves with the road. The wheels started to turn. The throne inched forwards. The men did not move. Another few inches on the hot road, the chipped rubber wheels of the throne gently kissing the asphalt. I must. Eye contact. The throne built momentum. The queen, the boy in the throne drove slowly through the three men, parting them, the boy's legs like water. He could feel their eyes burn his back like the sun burned his back. It took all his willpower not to speed up, not to run. With every step he could feel the machete bite into his shoulder and the shotgun round chew a chunk out of his neck. He kept pushing. He pushed until the men were an abstract, a nebulous fear. He never looked back. An hour passed. The Queen said, How were they dressed? My Queen, said the boy, his dry voice cracking. My subjects, how were they dressed? In the finest robes, my Queen, said the boy gold and silver and the richest furs. It was clear they had decked themselves in their finery to please you. Of course. How splendid. And the town? Freshly painted spires, my queen. The townspeople in speechless awe of your presence, not a single one daring to utter a sound lest it offend you. Banners of welcome, a huge outpouring of love for their queen. As it should be, said the queen as she adjusted her crown of crushed soda cans. How is the countryside, boy? Ah, my queen. Lush, verdant swathes of thick grass. Cornfields glowing golden in the summer sun. Thick forests. At this the boy stuttered. A chill ran up his spine. Go on, boy, ordered the queen. You are talking of the forests. The forests, my queen, they... The boy's breath had become shallow. He felt faint. Well said the Queen, impatient. I... I feel... The boy stumbled, jerking the throne slightly to one side. Boy, what is wrong with you? This is not pushing fit for your Queen. I I apologise, my Queen. I fear I must rest. You will not rest. You will push. You must always push. The boy murmured something, then dropped to his knees. In the shade of the stationary throne he breathed. The Queen was shrieking at him. The bear in the forest wasn't real, but the fear was. He had never seen a bear, not even in books, but he had been told stories as tall as four men, as wide as a cart capable of ripping a man in two, and fast, so much faster than a queen in a throne, so much faster than he could push. His hands still gripping the throne's handles were numb, white gristle. The queen's voice came back into focus. He reached the surface and gasped for air. Push, you must push, boy, the citadel awaits me. My apologies, my queen, the boy got to his feet 
put his shoulder to the handle and pushed. Now the forest, said the queen, after a few moments. The forest is out of sight now, my queen, replied the boy. The boy squinted into the low evening sun. The remains of a farmhouse lay ahead, stumps of picket fence like broken teeth. It appeared uninhabited. Our lodgings are up ahead, my queen, said the boy. Oh, very good. I am somewhat weary. My queen is resilient and strong, said the boy as he scanned the surrounding scrubland. I am. I am, mused the queen. The farmhouse consisted of three walls and half a roof. There had been a fire, or perhaps one of the bombs had landed nearby. Stairs led up to empty air. A ground floor bedroom was mostly intact. A glorious lodgings indeed, my queen. I have requested the largest skylight, so my queen may be bathed in starlight as she rests. How thoughtful. This goes some way towards making amends for your inelegant paws this afternoon, said the queen in clipped tones. I can only apologise again, my queen, said the boy as he parked the throne inside the doorway of the bedroom and started to retrieve supplies and equipment from it. It will not happen again. See that it doesn't. Jerking about, stopping and starting, it's not seemly. The boy nodded invisibly. The bedroom contained a bed frame and a small wooden bedside cabinet. The boy opened the drawer of the cabinet and looked inside. There was a slim, black, leather-bound book. The blind queen was snoring lightly, her head lolling back against the shopping trolley's handle. The boy's shoulders relaxed, like knots coming undone. He opened the book. Inside was handwriting, a journal or diary of some kind. He flipped to the last entry. It was dated almost two years ago. By the light of a single candle, the boy sat and read the journal. It was largely a day-to-day -day account of farm work, written by the teenage daughter of the farm owners. Escaping into another's life felt good. It felt like another world, one that the boy would never have had the chance to inhabit. Every now and then the girl would turn from harvesting and sowing and write about her feelings, her wants and needs, her desires. She wanted to leave the farm as soon as she could and start a life for herself in the city. She wanted to be a writer. She wanted to make dresses. She wanted to get married and have a baby. The boy closed the journal and stared into the candle. It was too late for his dreams. By the time he knew what desires were, they had already been denied him. He looked at the blind queen. Just a person. A person dressed in faded, stained lace and velvet with a crown of garbage on her head and scuffed, jeweled shoes caked in mud and shit. He loved her. He loved her because it was his role to do so. And if he didn't, he would have nothing. The girl in the journal felt trapped by her loving family and the work on the farm which fed them and provided income. What he would have given to live in that trap. He put the journal back in the bedside cabinet. He didn't want the girl to discover he had read it, even though he knew the girl was dead just like almost everybody else. He wondered if she'd been out in the fields when the bomb fell. Did she watch it land? Or did the heat reach her before the clouds sprouted on the horizon? Was she in the house making a thin paper sketch of a dress that curled and blackened just as she did? He would never know, and it didn't matter. He blew out the candle and lay down in the dark on the cold, sharp springs. The Queen's crown shone in the starlight he had promised her. Blind Queen was written by Alexander King. The narrator was Matthew Whitnell. Music and sound design by Ian J. Cole. 
You've been listening to An Endless Sky, Lost Transmissions from Strange Realities, a podcast of strange and beautiful words and music. See the show notes to find out more, or find us on Twitter at An Endless Sky. Thanks for listening. <laughs>